So I've got the uh, challenge of uh, following three great speakers, and we've got a break right around the corner. So uh, paying attention might be a little bit difficult for you. So what I've done was embedded in my slides, I've got some trivia. So if you know the answer to the trivia, I actually brought some prizes. So that'll help you focus and pay attention. So uh, if you know the answer to the question, raise your hand high so we can identify you, yell it out so we can hear you, and then you'll get a prize. And please, only one, uh, one correct answer per person, okay? Thank you very much. All right, my name is Luke Pack. I'm a patent attorney at Cislo and Thomas. We're a boutique law firm specializing in intellectual property laws. We obtain patents, trademarks, and copyrights, as well as enforcing these rights in court. And what I've come to realize over the course of my years of practice is that there's a lot of common misconceptions that inventors have regarding patents. And so what I want to do today is walk you through, no, no, sorry. I'm going to run you through a lot of these misconceptions because I've got to go quick. So here's typically what happens. Client comes in and he's got a great idea for a product. For example, how many of you have gotten into your cars and dropped your keys, your phone, your wallet, anything down that crack between your seat and the center console? Well, if you have, then you need one of these. It is a compressible wedge that fits in between that crack and it stops those items from dropping through. So a client comes out with this, they don't want to just sell this product on the market. They want to dominate the market. So how do you dominate the market? You dominate the market by creating one of these. Anybody know what this is? The Great Wall of China. No. A fence. Great, you, wall. Great Wall of China. Yes, right here. Right here. Great Wall of China. That's correct. So you want to create a barrier. You want to create a border around your invention so that nobody can enter into your space. Now, uh, that, I mean, how do you create that border? Use intellectual property. But what is intellectual property? This leads to our first myth. A lot of times, oh sorry, so intellectual property is your patents, uh, trademarks, and copyrights. So going to our first myth then, patents, trademarks, and copyrights, aren't they all the same thing? A lot of people think that they're all the same thing. <clears throat> Take this for example. Anybody recognize this guy? Who, right there, right there, right in the back. Michael Jackson. Right in the back there. Yeah. So, uh, Michael Jackson, that you guys recognize this. Here's what uh, Katie Couric wrote about Michael Jackson. King of Pop's most patented move. If you look down at the bottom, it says, she says here, it wasn't the King of Pop's most patented move. So what does she mean by patented? Does she mean that he's the first to do it? Does she mean that she's the only one that can do it? Does she, he, does she mean that uh, he's most recognized for doing it? What does she exactly mean? Because later on in the same article she says, there's no guarantee Jackson's trademark moves are part of the deal. So now is it patents or is it trademarks? What are we talking about here? Well, let me dispel that for you. So patents generally cover your useful process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter. These are the products that you guys are coming out with. So in the case of that compressible wedge, it's the actual product itself or the process for manufacturing that product or for using that product. Then what are trademarks? Well, trademarks are your uh, word, name, similar device, or any combination, combination thereof used by a person to identify and distinguish his or her goods from those manufactured or sold by others. This is your name brand. So in this case of the compressible wedge, we're talking about the drop stop. So that's how you brand your name so people can identify your product over somebody else's competing product. And how about copyrights then? Well, copyrights are your original works of authorship. And these are the likes of literary works, musical works, dramatic works, pantomimes, choreographs, pictures, graphs, motion pictures, sound recordings, and audio, visual, and art architectural works. So these are the kinds of things that you think about when you think of artists and authors. Now we've got a bunch of scientists and engineers out here. You're probably wondering, how, how does this relate to us? Well, if you've got a product, you've probably got one of these advertising your product. It's your website. So well, your website might be something that is copyright protectable. So dispelling myth number one, yes, there is a difference between patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And you should seek initial consultation with an attorney so you can figure out which of these you might be uh, eligible for in terms of getting uh, IP protection. So the rest of my talk, I'm going to be talking about patents. We're dispelling patent myths. And that leads to our next, uh, next, our next myth. All right, so what clients tend to think, they think, oh, I can patent anything, can't I? Well, there was a point in time when the Supreme Court, the highest law of the land, said, Anything under the sun that is made by man is patent eligible. So you can practic practically patent anything. There are three exceptions, however. Those exceptions are laws of nature, natural phenomena, and principles and abstract ideas. Again, you're thinking, we're here with a bunch of medical devices. Do, do any of these apply to us? Well, Supreme Court took this up. Law of nature. There was a case uh, for a diagnostic test. Here's what the patent was for. 
It was a method of optimizing therapeutic efficacy for treatment of an immune-mediated gastrointestinal disorder. Here are the steps. You gotta administer a drug providing 6-thioguanine. You gotta determine the level of 6-thioguanine. And you gotta, if, there's a, if it's above a certain amount, you gotta increase the dose. If it's, a, it's lower than a certain amount, you gotta decrease the dose. What did the Supreme Court say about this? They said, the question before us is whether the claims do significantly more than simply describe these natural relations. To put the matter more precisely, do the patent claims add enough to their statement of correlation to allow processes they describe to qualify as patent eligible process that apply natural laws? Supreme Court says, no. It's a diagnostic test and they say, that's, that's a law of nature, you can't do that. All right, how about natural phenomenon then? Anybody into genetics? Anybody know what the BRCA, mutation of the BRCA1 gene is an increased factor for? Breast cancer. Breast cancer, right here, right here, breast cancer. All right, so here's what the Supreme Court said about this gene. This case involves patents filed by Myriad after it made one such medical breakthrough. This is a medical breakthrough. And then they say, uh, Myriad did not create anything. To be sure, it found an important and useful gene. But then they say, but separating the gene from its surrounding genetic material is not an active invention. This patent was invalidated by the Supreme Court. He said, that's a natural phenomenon. All right, how about abstract ideas? Again, you might be thinking, hey, I got products. These aren't abstract ideas, it's a physical machine you can look at. Well, if you're using a computer to implement the technology, you might have to run across this case. And in this case, uh, this is 2014, uh, they added a computer to something that's been, been done over the years and said, no, the, uh, if a patent's recitation of a computer amounts to mere instruction to implement an abstract idea on a computer, that addition cannot impart patent, uh, uh, patent eligibility. Uh, regarding this specific patent, they said the claim that issue amounts to nothing significantly more than an instruction to apply the abstract idea of intermediate settlement using some unspecified generic computer. So if you're just do using a computer and using it for what it's intended to be used for, making calculations, making things go a little bit faster, a little more efficient, that may not be enough for patent eligible subject matter. So, no, you cannot patent anything. You've got to watch out for these exceptions. And it seems like uh, you, that uh, in a medical uh, technology industry, you don't have to worry about them, but in fact you do, because if you're dealing with these things that I just talked about, uh, this first criteria for patentability, patent eligible subject matter, becomes an issue. All right, that leads us to uh, myth number three. Anybody recognize this symbol? Walmart. Who said that? Well, right there, Walmart, yes. So here's what I hear from my clients all the time. They say, Hey, there's nothing like it on the market. Can I get a patent on that? Well, what they're referring to is the second criteria of patentability, which is novelty. Novelty means that there's nothing out there before your invention. There's nothing out there already published that you've already made. And the mistake that the clients are making here is they think if it didn't make it to the market, it doesn't exist. But there are a lot of reasons why things don't make it to the market. Take this for example. Here's a device to uh, help control that secondhand smoke. Slap that on your head, go ahead and take a puff of smoke. smoke the smoke goes into the contraption, gets filtered out, and you don't have to worry about secondhand smoke anymore. Right? This was patented, but you don't see this on the market. Or how about this one? This is great. Let's read that. It is a uh, apparatus for facilitating the birth of a child using centrifugal force. Pregnant mothers, lie on this contraption, let that thing spin you around, the baby pops right out. That's great, that was patented. Well, you don't see this on the market, right? How about this one? Right, we're moving into the age of driverless, uh, driverless cars. So these guys thought, hey, let's put some high-tech adhesive on the front of the fender, uh, on the hood. Why? Because if you happen to hit somebody, it's better for them to stick to the front of the hood <laughs> than get tossed about because you might get hit secondarily, right? These guys got a patent, and you know who got the patent? Google, ah, uh, Google. So this is serious stuff, all right? So there are a lot of reasons why things don't make it into the market. It might be uh, not good, the technology might not work, it just might be stupid, or maybe it's before it's time, we don't know. But the point of the matter is, what you need to do is you have to conduct a search for prior art. Now prior art is the, the published uh, references that come before your invention and that will tell you uh, whether, or not, whether or not you are eligible for a patent. So let's say you would conducted your search and you find all these references. Uh, what we do is we present it to our clients and what, what they'll invariably say, 
Oh, sorry, I should say this. If you don't want to conduct a search, you can conduct a search either on the PTO website. It's not so easy, uh, but it's free to use. Google Patents is another resource that you can use. And then uh, if, you, if you need to, you can commission a search, have a professional do it. Now, oftentimes what happens is we conduct a search for our clients and they get their results back. And here's what they say. Mine's different. Can I get a patent now? <laughs> so this is um, another example of another criteria that you have to overcome. And maybe some of you can relate to this example. So, uh, you know, this, uh, if you take a shower, sometimes you get that piece of soap. If you look to the right, a little soap chip. It's hard to use, hard to lather up, slips out of your hand. And so what you end up doing is you just bust out a new soap bar. And then what ends up happening is you start collecting all your soap chips at the bottom of your tub. Well, there was a mature law school student. He thought, you know what? I'm going to solve this problem. I have an idea. What if we created a soap that looks like this? You create some ridges on the top. That way, when the soap chip gets small, you just smash it into those ridges. That way, you can use up that small soap chip. So, uh, being a law school student, he didn't have any money, so he filed his own patent application. And here's what happened. He got a rejection from the patent office. The patent office said, this is prior art. There was a soap already out there in Germany that was patented in Germany, and it's got these ridges, and you take that soap chip, and you smash it in there, and it looks like that. And so he thought, well, wait a second. But when you compare these two, it's different, right? You can look at the surface, and you can say, these are concentric rings, these are straight ridges, and the patent office said, no. Now, you know, some people say, well, it's 10% different, 20% different, isn't that enough? No. It's not a quantitative difference, it's a qualitative difference. It is about obviousness. The question is, was the difference an obvious modification? In this case, the uh, patent office said, yes, you know, concentric ridges, uh, straight ridges, it's an obvious matter of design choice. Anybody could have switched it around and made it straight. So uh, this law school student didn't get his patent, but that has a, a happy ending because he did become a patent attorney. And because of this experience, he now is very passionate about patent law, goes around dispelling myths and misconceptions about patent law. <laughs> so that brings us to myth number four. Uh, so that's myth number four. Being different is not enough. The difference has to be non-obvious. But what do, we, what do we mean by non-obvious? We mean this. Anybody recognize this animal? Squirrel. More specific. Sugar glider. What is it? Sugar glider. Sugar glider. Is that the... Right there, flying squirrel. <laughs> That's the one I wanted, right here, flying squirrel. All right, look at this. All right, who would put an excess flap of skin underneath the armpit of a squirrel? All right, That's not obvious. They look kind of different. This is what we're talking about. You want, you want to get think outside the box, not just a regular modification of a design choice. All right, now, you've, you've gotten your, uh, uh, you did your, uh, you've got patent eligible subject matter, you've got novelty, you've got, you think you've got non-obviousness, so you start telling everybody about your invention. So they say, hey, everybody loves my idea. Can I get a patent now? Well, that depends, because uh, sometimes if you test it on your friends, you take it to a trade show, you sell it on the internet, you publish it in a journal article, you give it a presentation at a conference, all of this constitutes a public disclosure. If you publicly disclose your patent, you've got one year to file for an application, because if you don't, your own publication, your own public disclosure bars you from getting a patent application, uh, filing a patent application. So, uh, the spelling myth number five, no, you cannot. What you need to do is, if you did disclose it, if you did tell people, so some of it's a secret disclosure, I won't get into that, but if it's a public disclosure, you've got one year to file the application, so it's better if you keep your invention secret before you file your application. All right, so now you've jumped through the hurdles. You've got patent eligible subject matter, novelty, non-obviousness. You haven't told anybody. It's time to write the application. When, uh, here's the parts of the application. So application generally consists of uh, drawings that kind of show what your inventions looks like. There is the written description that has a detailed explanation of what the patent is. And then at the very end, you've got what are called the claims. The claims actually define the scope of your invention. So keep that in mind as we continue on. Now. What happens is, when we're ready to write the application, this is what the clients say to me, hey, I don't have to tell you everything about my invention, do I? So what they're trying to say is, uh, they've got something that they don't want to disclose to us. This typically comes up in process claims when we're talking about a method of manufacturing a product. This can come up with computer implemented technology because they've got some kind of unique algorithm that they don't want to share with you. These are the kinds of things where when you look at the uh, product, you can't tell what the inventive concept is. It's hard to reverse engineer. And because it's hard to reverse engineer, they say, oh, oh I, I don't want to tell you that part. Now, 
The rule is though, you have to disclose enough to teach somebody how to make and use your invention. So if you're holding back that uh, secret sauce, and that's the secret sauce you need to actually get your machine running, then your patent can be invalidated. So uh, you do want to uh, disclose everything. If you're purposely holding back some information because you didn't want to share it, then you might consider holding it as a trade secret. On the other hand, if you don't know what the details are, sometimes you've got a team and somebody else is working on it, talk to your team member and figure out what that information is. Get that information to your attorney because you've got to get it into the application and then you're going to find out why. Now, uh, oh, first thing is, uh, because once you file an application, you can't add to the application. So what's it, once it's filed, it's a closed door. And, you're, and if you try to add it later on, you're going to get a lot of problems that we're going to, uh, that we'll address for you uh, right after this. All right. Anybody know what show, uh, what movie this is from? Who said that? Who said that? <laughs> Second, who, oh, back there, right there in the back. All the way in the back, yeah. A few good bands. So this is Colonel Nathan Jessup undergoing criminal prosecution. When, an, when a patent application gets filed, it undergoes patent prosecution. So what patent prosecution means is that there's a search and examination. So the patent office will conduct a search for prior art and see what else is out there. When they've got a list of prior art that they, uh, that they find relevant to your uh, invention, then they conduct an examination. And that examination can be unpleasant. And here's why. Because invariably, uh, when you file an application, more often than not, uh, your patent application will be rejected and you gotta uh, demonstrate why it should be patentable. And that leads us to myth number seven. So when we present a rejection to our clients, this is what, and we'll say, hey, how, how would you like to distinguish your invention over the prior art? This is what they'll say. The prior art requires X feature and we don't need that. This is what they'll say. But that is not the proper analysis. So this is uh, looking at the drop stop. I'll give you an example. This is not how the drop stop was prosecuted. This is just for illustrative purposes only. So let's just assume that this is the prior art against this drop stop. So what a client might say is, oh, well, the prior art has this loop at the end. We don't have that. That's the myth. Prior art requires X. We don't need that. That is the incorrect analysis. The way you do the analysis is you say, uh, we claim X. The prior art does not have X. So what? So if the claims for that drop stop were something like this, a device comprising an elongated member having two ends and a slot through the elongated member at one end, this is the analysis you would do. Here's my elongated member with two ends. There's the slot through the elongated member. You look at the prior art and it has no slot. That's the way you do the analysis. That's how you distinguish over the prior art. Which leads us to uh, myth number eight then. So this is uh, real tricky, but uh, watch carefully. Sometimes the client will say, we have X, the prior art does not. Now that sounds like myth number seven, but there was a subtle distinction. And that subtle distinction was, we have X versus we claim X. So here's what, what can happen. Here's our claims again for the drop stop, a uh, device comprising elongated member. There's your elongated member having two ends. There's your two ends and a slot through the uh, elongated member at one end, which is right there. Now, what if this is the prior art? The examiner is going to say, well, there's your elongated member, there's your two ends, and there's your slot through the elongated member at one end. And then the client will say, oh, no, 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 no. But our product is compressible. This is rigid. But the problem is it doesn't say a compressible elongated member. It says elongated member. So you can't say we have X and the prior art doesn't. You have to say we claim X. So if the feature that you're relying on to get over the prior art is not claimed, you can't rely on it. You have to claim it. So the first question is, was it claimed? If it wasn't claimed, that's okay. Because if it was disclosed in the written description or shown in the drawing, you can amend your claims to add it. But if you didn't write about it in the first place, you can't add it after the fact. This is why myth number six is so important. Tell the attorney everything. Because you're going to write about everything. You might claim a certain thing. But only if it's in the application can you actually uh, amend, your men, uh, amend your claims to add it. All right, so you've jumped through all the hoops, you've gotten your patent, here's what uh, I hear all the time uh, once the patent is granted. Now that I got a patent, I'm safe, right? So what are they implying here? What they're saying is that they want to, oh, before I get, let me ask you this, pay attention, here we go. Anybody know where this is from? Oh, sorry, missed. <laughs> that was both of these for the safe. Anybody know what this is from? Excalibur, right here, right here. Excalibur, all right. How about, how about this one? 
Whose is this? Captain America. Where was that? Right there, right there. Captain America. <laughs> All right. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to say that the, uh, they're trying to use uh, their um, patent as a shield. But a patent is not a shield. It is a sword. You use it to assert against somebody. If somebody's infringing your patent, you say, no, you cannot do that. You assert it. But if somebody says to you, you're, a, you're infringing my patent, you can't put up your patent and say, oh, no, 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 I got a patent on that. You can't, you can't sue me. And yes, they can't, because the patent is a sword. It is not a shield. All right, and then going to myth number 10. Last one, anybody recognize? What country does this represent? China. Right, who was it? Was it you? China. Over here, over here, China over here. Right here. Okay, bring it right here. He's got it right here. All right, so here's what the clients say. All right, so there's a company in China infringing my U.S. patent. Let's stop it. Well, you can't unless you have a Chinese patent because patents are jurisdictional. You need a patent in each country in which you want to enforce it. So if you didn't file in a separate country, in a foreign country, you can't insert your U.S. patent. So uh, you can stop the importation of it into the U.S., but you're not gonna be able to enforce it. Uh, and one option that you might consider is what's called the Patent Cooperation Treaty for uh, starting an international process. Uh, we won't get into that, uh, but uh, that is uh, it. So uh, I do have a summary sheet of these uh, common myths dispelled. If you want a summary sheet, one pager, come see me. I've got a booth out there, you can take a look. Um, otherwise, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much.